Hello, I'm Bruce the Blog, and this is Frank J. Rich, and you're watching Bruce the Blog Goes Bazo presents Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog. Again and welcome to uh, we're, do we're doing something new uh, with Bruce the Blog Goes Bazo, where Frank J. Rich, uh, Chief Strategic Officer of Chase Media Group, and I will be interviewing uh, all kinds of people in the community: community leaders, uh, elected officials, uh, business people. Uh, and if you have any suggestions, or maybe you yourself want to be on, uh, you can email me at b a p a r at Chase Media Group. Com. We also want to remind you that you can watch these shows on our YouTube channel, NCN Local TV. You just go to YouTube and type those letters into the uh, search field and, and you'll see a lot of shows uh, with a lot of interesting people that we speak with. And uh, we also want to re quickly remind you we are brought to you by the Penny Saver and by Chase Media Group. And we thank Frank J. Rich and Carla Chase, CEO, for uh, producing the show. We want to welcome and we're very... Uh, pleased and honored to have with us the Honorable Nan Hayworth, the uh, U.S. Representative you, for District 18. Uh, and without go getting into too much inside baseball detail, uh, it's becoming District 18 from District 19. Right. Currently right? it's District 19, so I right. am officially the representative for District 19 of New York. Right. And uh, you're just, I guess, uh, ending or... or uh, Heading towards your the end of your first term, uh, yes. seeking re-election, obviously. Right? Yes. Um, and um, you know, there's a lot of things going on, uh, Representative Hayworth. As you know, we just came out of the national conventions. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of national conversations about a lot of very sensitive topics mm -hmm. uh, yes. that, unfortunately, can polarize people. Uh, hopefully, we can try and pull everybody together right. on them. And and I know Frank uh, has some some thoughts on, um, you know wanting to ask you where you stand sure. you know, on these topics, especially exactly. to help voters out there you know, understand your position sure. uh, versus your opponent, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I am delighted to answer those questions. I, I, I hope to be worthy of, of uh, the voters' trust, and, right. and that uh, is something that is uh, my job every day. Right. So everything we do, and I work with a great team of people, uh, is directed towards serving everybody here. Right. Uh, regardless of their party, regardless of their situation in life. Right. Okay. Yeah, uh, just outline, if you would, please, uh, the issues that are most pressing for you and, mm -hmm. and how they relate to the American public. And sure. what about them uh, uh, reveals uh, your thinking and ethic mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and the opportunity for uh, improvement? I travel all around our district uh, and uh, the new district and the old have very similar footprints. It's the Hudson Valley, both sides of the river. So Orange County from the Pennsylvania border all the way through Southern Dutchess, Putnam, Northern Westchester to the Connecticut border. Uh, beautiful Hudson River in the, in the midst of it. What are people talking <coughs> about? Uh, you can imagine the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, that really is the overwhelming topic in all of its different aspects. So people are worried about the cost of living here, and uh, not only for themselves, but uh, for their children, their, their adult children, uh, and their, their young ones who are coming up in this uh, beautiful place that is a very expensive place to live. Where are they going to find jobs? Uh, there has been, unfortunately, a progressive rise in the unemployment rate, uh, and uh, these are great people who are smart and hardworking and talented. Uh, and this is a state with a wonderful heritage of innovation and enterprise and industry. Uh, so those are, those are painful uh, things when people fear that 
they're not going to be able to have the jobs and the opportunity here that they want. Uh, so I would say those are the those are the themes that are the most consistent, um, combined with another that. It has to do with being a federal legislator in particular, and that is people want members of both parties to work together, and I agree with them. So I, in fact, in January of 2011, when I first took office, I was invited by a fellow freshman, a Democrat, to, to found the Common Ground Caucus mm -hmm. to bring Democrats right. and Republicans together as friends. Uh, and I was very happy to do that, and I have worked with Democratic colleagues uh, consistently, because it is very important for us to have uh, that sense that we that we are in this together, uh, and I agree. Certainly, that was one of the themes at the Democratic convention, and I agree with it. Where our philosophy uh, tends to differ is in the role of government in the life of the individual citizen. And Frank, when you mentioned, you know, how does how do these issues relate to the principles that I hold deeply or the inspiration for running for office. Uh, and it is that this nation uniquely, our strength, is that we were founded to respect the spirit and the dignity of the individual citizen uh, and to, to let that shine through uh, in every way that we can. So how do we honor that liberating, marvelous, uh, ex extraordinary, exceptional, concept, unique in all of history uh, and in all the world, and yet offer the opportunity that we need in a, a complex world. Well, well, regarding unemployment, it seems a fundamental difference between the two parties yeah. is, and this is the question, to what extent should the government play a role in job creation? Right. Well, we have, there is an important role for government at the local level, the state level, the federal level. They, they all have a purpose that they need to serve and they need to do so uh, efficiently and effectively with a minimal burden created on uh, the citizens and on the taxpayers. Uh, so the federal government's job is brilliantly defined in the Constitution. It is to provide the framework in which our vigorous uh, democracy, of course representative democracy, but in our vigorous democracy uh, can flower and people can live their lives according to their talents, according to their conscience, uh, within a safe, secure, uh, strong nation uh, that has appropriate protections uh, so that we don't fall victim to uh, ill intent by others. Uh, but where the federal government doesn't create jobs is where it attempts to intervene in uh, our economy. Uh, the federal government simply is not, it, it's not good at that because decisions in the economy have to be made by people who are actually uh, putting their own uh, effort and their own time and their own dollars uh, at risk. They'll make much smarter decisions than the government will. The government makes politically motivated decisions about the economy. It's inevitable. There is no multiplier for federal involvement in the economy, but there's a great multiplier, a great expansion of mm -hmm. energy when people are allowed to work hard the way you do, the way right. you do on your publications uh, and on your work. When you add value, that translates into to dollars that you can use to help other people. Right. Yeah, I, you know, well said. Uh, I think uh, uh, certainly we're left with uh, with uh, a nagging challenge, and and uh, that is uh, an, a better understanding about what actually caused the loss of jobs mm -hmm. and um, uh, the economic content, its uh, relationship to uh, our societal uh, mood or ethic, right. and um, and just exactly what uh, what. Role government plays uh, as a as a watchdog, for instance, sure. uh, in better preparing uh, to serve a society which, uh, by constitutional edict, uh, was uh, meant to protect uh, property and uh, individual freedom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, in the early days, only six percent of the population got to vote as a result of that because there were uh, very few That's property right. owners. That's right. There but were a lot of wrongs we had to right. Yeah, but today, but today, I mean, th there were adjustments uh, that I, I would say adjustments that were necessary, and that speaks to the issue I think between what are adjustments and what are wrongs and rights, and yes. 
And what are what we're really pursuing? Are we looking for what's right and wrong, or mm -hmm. what's wrong? And you know, sort of like if you're looking for the enemy, what are you going to find? Right. The enemy. And uh, and so you know, how how where the where were the jobs lost? Uh, sure. uh, under what circumstances? Mm -hmm. And what do we do about that? Right. What economically and socially is necessary to recover sure. uh, from lost jobs? Sure. Well, fundamentally, uh, the, the principle that we want to drive toward is allowing as many resources, uh, time, energy, dollars, to remain in the citizen economy as opposed to in the workings of our government. Fundamentally, that's what we want to accomplish. Uh, and, you know, how do we do that? When you say our we, government. Can I interrupt you when you say we. How do we as a nation? Okay. You know, and how do I as a federal legislator help that mm -hmm. to happen? Uh, you know, when we look at, we do have a, a, a set of challenges before us that have accumulated over decades, um, and part of our uh, part of our uh, shared task is to think together about. Um, how, as you said, Frank, how we got to this point. Most of us, for most of us, our frame of reference is post-World War II. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you know, I was born in the, at the end of 59. Uh, but for the, the couple of decades after World War II, and my parents both uh, are World War II veterans, uh, we in the United States were a colossus over a world that couldn't compete with us because we were the ones left standing and strong after that war. It took a couple of decades for the world to catch up with us uh, and compete successfully against us. And during that time, of course, uh, we developed a very, uh, we had a, a vigorous consumer economy to begin with, but we developed an exceedingly vigorous consumer society with a young, vigorous workforce, a relatively minimal uh, entitlement or uh, you know, safety net uh, challenge because of course the the population was different we had a different uh, a different age structure than we do now so we accumulated a lot of obligations in terms of of uh, good things that we want to see happen for people pensions and benefits and and, and things that uh, you know we want people to have uh, health care and and something to fall back on when they're in their uh, when they're in their senior years. Uh, but all of those programs have become very large because we've had our, our population has aged, uh, people are living longer, thank God. Baby boomers are entering Medicare, 10,000 a day, Medicare and Social Security. Uh, and so these, these very well-meaning obligations have become very large parts of uh, the, the, the responsibility that our federal government has to uh, has to uh, fulfill. So we have to look at the tasks that the federal government uh, really has to honor. And of course, constitutionally, we have defense, we have international relations, we have uh, broad protections. I would say environmental protections certainly fall into that. Mm -hmm. uh, interstate transportation and commerce, you know, all the things that a federal government needs to do. And we also have, uh, at this stage in our history, a very large uh, safety net. Uh, that needs to stay intact. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. So the reason I would say that, that we got into the particular problem we did in 2008 was because federal policy of intervention in the economy, specifically in the housing and mortgage part of the economy, actually resulted in investments being made in ways that, that ended up not being wise. Uh, and, and there were various ways that the federal government helped that to happen. Now, it's true, uh, you know, people in, in the investment marketplace uh, took off uh, with that, and they uh, did a lot of things that uh, took advantage of vulnerability, and that shouldn't happen. Uh, but unfortunately, the policies of the federal government made it easy for those things to happen. The actions of the Federal Reserve also helped make those things happen. And when you have this sort of artificial uh, bubble building, uh, inevitably something, you know, reality will hit and it'll crash. And that's what happened. So, so much of it, every time the federal government gets involved in the economy, 
military industrial complex. You know, President Eisenhower warned about it. It's right. really true. That's how you get the $7,000 screwdriver. Yeah. Because somewhere along the line <laughs> right. tells a federal official uh, or a senator or a congressperson, hey, that's an important thing. We need that. Even though economically it may not seem to make sense, guess what? We need that. And it's happened in all these different uh, different sectors. Uh, I you know, worry about it happening in the energy sector. Solyndra, you know, there are wise investments and not wise. So we need to minimize the unwise investments of, of, uh, of taxpayer dollars, uh, take care of the obligations and responsibilities that we have, and make the tax code fairer and flatter. Stop doing favors for uh, every industry that sidles up to a senator or a congressperson. Uh, so that we can actually grow the economy and be able to afford the things we need to do. Right. Well, I, I just want to, you know, take a moment. I don't want to dwell too much on this because we do have other topics we we want to get to. Um, but would you would you consider an example of you know, private investment that will help, you know, the economy? And, and then this is a lightning rod issue right now, especially in, in your district in part, uh, fracking, yeah. hydrofracking. Yeah. Um, you know that theoretically can create jobs and actually sure. can create, a, I mean, it is a kind of an industry now, but it yeah, could it become is. a bigger industry. Sure. So, I mean, so you support, you know, that uh, as the kind of an investment you're talking about well, on the supply side. Clearly a very important element of having successful businesses, small or large, and having a, an affordable cost of living. You know, because we want to grow small businesses are the engine of our economy, and they're very sensitive to the cost of regulation, to the cost of taxes, to the cost of energy. Uh, and in our Hudson Valley, of course, people are already struggling. So if we can have cleaner energy, right. that, that you know, carbon energy we're going to be relying on for decades right. to come, we want to minimize that. Eventually we want to be free of it, but right now we, we're, we're, we're stuck with that. So cleaner carbon energy, if we can develop it uh, at a, at, at a, in a safe way, right. uh, then it will benefit us because it will be cheaper energy, it will be environmentally safer, and it will indeed grow jobs. Right. Well, I, I think you know, good, a good uh, 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 fundamental explanation of where the job losses uh, came from, mm. uh, the collateral debt uh, movement uh, born maybe 25 years ago, yeah. uh, has led to some some bad decision making. But uh, in your explanation and uh, in my own review of things, it it uh, it it becomes apparent to me, at least, that. We're, we're looking at the DNA or the natural inclinations of these institutions, both, mm -hmm. uh, both government institutions and business institutions. It is natural for business people to be creative about the next product yes. and how they can actually win in the marketplace, as it were. Uh, our, our other natural tendency to look lightly at the, uh, at the, the, the uh, uh, effect on the whole, so to speak, is it for the greater good, yeah. is, not, is not in the business DNA as a, as a rule. Uh, it, it, it is supposed to be in the government's DNA. So thus you have, you have compliance, regulations, and, mm -hmm. uh, and watchdog uh, uh, activity, so to speak. Uh, the two have not done well together. Uh, there seems to be an attitude that either one uh, will be self-adjusting and, and manage effectively mm -hmm. the solutions that are necessary to, uh, to growth or sustained mm -hmm. growth, or the other, mm -hmm. which is to control and to, uh, and to uh, 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 direct mm -hmm. right. uh, the, the efforts of the other right. sectors. Right. Is this is this natural inclination, which is unique to each institution? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is 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 there a solution to this? Is there a way in your mind right. to do this cooperatively? Yeah. Uh, the polite artifices of uh, of the common cause uh, caucuses right. aside. Right. Um, great way of putting it. Uh, yes, I think there is, uh, and uh, so much of it depends on number one, uh, being able to. Uh, recognize uh, the common sense, if you will, and realizing that yes, you know Potter good, Stewart's good definition. Point. You know, <laughs> I know it when I see it. But, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, right. but, but still, in all, you know, there. Are, I, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, there, uh, a highway bill, the last highway bill that was passed before the current one, contained a provision that required every uh, municipality uh, across the country to replace their road signs by uh, 2014 with road signs that were made with a more reflective material. Now, 
that certainly the arguments were, were made, uh, no doubt that this would enhance safety, you know, because people would be able to see those signs more easily uh, in, in darkness. However, it turns out that, number one, in a down economy, that's going to cost our, we, it was brought to our attention, uh, to my attention, by one of our town supervisors here, uh, and so uh, Mr. Lucas of North Salem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it, it turns out that the reason for that uh, requirement was that it was uh, something of an earmark for 3M Corporation because they're the only ones mm -hmm. that make that material. Mm -hmm. And they got the ear of mm -hmm. uh, some people and they managed to make, you know, everybody managed to make it sound like a beneficial thing. But in fact, uh, the motivation wasn't entirely pure and really our road signs are perfectly adequate uh, in mm -hmm. almost every jurisdiction with modern headlights. You know, uh -huh. Most of us don't go around saying, wow, I can't see that road sign because it doesn't reflect enough. It's one thing if you're gonna be replacing them anyway, fine, then you know, get the more reflective material. Uh, but this is or just one. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. But you know, just one you know, as an eye doctor, yeah. But you know, just one example, and there are millions of them. Right. Uh, you know, right. where something that sounds as though you know you can make the argument that it's a beneficial right. thing, but nobody's weighed the the actual cost versus the benefit. Right. So we need to have uh, more public awareness of the challenge we face now because again our economy has changed the world has changed we're in a much more competitive world than we were in 1957 you know we could afford to uh, make more costly uh, mistakes uh, perhaps in terms of public policy uh, we had excess resources relative to the rest of the world not so now so when people say well we did that in the 50s or we did that in the 60s and it worked you always have to bear in mind all the different changing factors and it's so important for the public to be engaged because if they're vigilant uh, then there will be uh, much more uh, uh, incentive for public officials to do things that make sense. Right. Sure, Dan, but only half the people vote in a national yeah. election, and and uh, despite the growth of um, uh, referendum and and uh, uh, ballot initiatives and and other uh, mechanisms for involving people more yeah. frequently and more insistently right. in the political process, right. um, uh, we have a representative form of government. Yes. We are not a democracy. Right. And so, well, we're a representative democracy. Well, we're 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 a republic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Uh, but not a pure democracy. Right, so, no. so it, there's a difference between electing an official and and oh, voting on a referendum. Right. Yes, and we're a federal. Um, and and if the rule of Congress is is a quid pro quo uh, mm -hmm. for accomplishment, yeah. What what is the potential for actually solving these things within a body that sure. that uh, that finds your mark so easily? Well. Uh, <laughs> That's it, it, it is it is true that we have you know look I, I was elected by the constituents in the Hudson Valley uh, when I go to Congress I have to think of their best interests not only in terms of uh, my role locally uh, as their representative to make sure that what concerns the Hudson Valley is heard in Washington right. and we don't do things that will harm the Hudson Valley we do whatever we can to help the Hudson Valley but also in terms of the big policy for that road sign issue I actually wrote a letter at, to Secretary LaHood and ran around getting colleagues from around the country to sign the letter and we were able to lift that mandate right. uh, Secretary LaHood actually lifted that mandate which was wonderful saved millions and millions billions of dollars across the country uh, which was great uh, but it does uh, the, the, in terms of quid pro quo you have to be able to cooperate uh, with uh, other members of Congress and and me the Senate as a body. I'm one of the, the members of the House Majority who's been on conference committees with, uh, I've been on one, I've been assigned to another, with the Senate. Uh, so we're under scrutiny, and the more public scrutiny there is, the more public engagement there is, uh, a contented uh, public tends not to notice as much. Um, and, and that's kind of the natural regulator. People are unhappy now. Uh, the economy isn't well, or doing. Or disengaged public. Well, but I think they're engaging more now, Frank, because they see these urgent issues right before their eyes. I spoke with a wonderful gentleman last night who's probably working 20 hour days uh, driving uh, a car service. Uh, and a lovely man, three sons, 
uh, none of them right now has a, a regular job. Right. Uh, and they're 21 to 23, and uh, you know, one of them's finishing up school, but you know, he's worried. They're all living at home. Uh, you know, what are their prospects? And they live here in New York. Uh, you know, and this is the kind of thing that gets people involved and engaged. Yeah, and I want to, we're heading down the home stretch, and I want to make sure, uh, I think all three of us want to make sure that we address, we ask you about the Affordable Care Act, because sure. obviously that is the overarching right. issue and has been for uh, quite a, a long time. Uh, very quickly, first, I just want to thank you because, as a citizen, not as I don't even I'm not registered with any political party, I'm independent. Mm -hmm. But a very well placed source told me that, told us, Frank and I, that you have told your your staff you do not want it referred to as anything but its official name. Right. And we know you know what people like to call, what opponents like to call it Obamacare, right. which frankly trash that. talking doesn't help anybody. So. I agree. But but anyhow, you, you, what you've said, that Representative Hayworth, is that you agree with the goals, yes. but not the legislation. Exactly. Right? Right. The goals are the right goals. Right. And I think that's when we talk about common ground. I couldn't agree more. And uh, my Democratic colleagues and I uh, a absolutely agree on what we want to see for our future. We want a better future for every uh, person in this country, whatever their age is. Certainly we worry about future generation, about generations and about the kids, but how do we get there? That's, uh, that's obviously where the, you know, that's always the second point. With the Affordable Care Act, a perfect example. Every American should have access to good health care and should be able to afford insurance. That's just common sense. It's just right. I agree. But how do we do it? This is a bad law. There are better ways to do it. Uh, and my four quick points, and I'm happy to explain them. I know we, okay. we're almost sure, out no, of time. Ahead, time. Health savings accounts for everyone. Make that happen. We can help people who uh, don't have the dollars to put into those accounts. We can help them. Health savings accounts, because then people make sensible decisions with their doctors in their own lives. You don't have the government forcing them to make decisions. Two, open up the insurance marketplace. Right. Choice and competition always works. We can make it happen. Health insurance shouldn't necessarily be any more complicated to buy than auto insurance. We can do that. Three, real liability reform, because in this country, uniquely in all the world, we have uh, a, a liability culture that adds tremendously to the cost of medical care, defensive medicine and malpractice issues. And fourth, make sure that yes, we are helping the people most in need. And we can very readily do that when we manage our insurance picture more sensibly. And I'm happy to provide anybody who wants to know more about it, happy to provide more details. Well, that, that may be a, a critical issue, and I want you yeah. to, to carry this forward, but uh, let me yeah. just say, is, is, is uh, are a sincere and, and reasonable efforts a respectable result by your constituency, or in the eyes of the mm -hmm. constituency? Mm -hmm. Are they enlightened and involved enough to manage that equation? I will tell you, I and I. It, it requires engagement on my part. You know, I I have a, an obligation to the the people I serve to listen to them, and you can only listen when you're going out and you know you're going to those community gatherings, the small businesses, community organizations, uh, senior centers, uh, you know, you name it. I go and I talk with people. I listen to them. Uh, and then explain to them, look, as your, as your representative in Congress, here's what I think I should be doing for you. Here's why I voted the way I did. Uh, and, and pieces of legislation can have many parts. So sometimes there's a dominant part that I object to, that's going to be a no. So full disclosure approach. Exactly. Or there's a dominant part that I agree with, and, and there may be Good a couple parts I don't like as well. Way. <laughs> well, exactly. Well, you know, uh, very few things in life are 100-0. Yeah. Uh, you know, my husband always says that, and he's right. And uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I admire him as a business leader, uh, he's a, and he's a medical leader as well, uh, their practice has a no, no layoff policy. Oh, okay. And in, in this day and age, I think that's a wonderful thing. And that's, you know, when, when, you have, uh, when you have leadership that cares about people, that's what I try to emulate. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and uh, we have to wrap it up because time is up. And we want to thank Representative, the Honorable Dr. Nan Hayworth. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for being you. with thank us. You, and yeah. and we'll have you back again. I'd I mean, love we're to going to have back. you back again because there's a lot more to talk about. I want to thank Frank J. Rich, my co host. And remember when Bruce the Blog listens, people talk. Thanks for watching.